<laughs> Good afternoon and wrap this up so we're on time. So uh, my name is Steve Duranso and for those of you that don't know me, I put together a slide, but we're going to be talking about uh, drinking water for the next 15 minutes. And though many of you may not know that this is regulated by the Food and Drug Administration and it costs a dollar about. When you open up your tap water and you drink out of your faucet, that's regulated by the Environmental Protection Agency and you get a thousand gallons for about a dollar, just saying. So uh, I've been at UCF for going on almost uh, 13 into my 14th year. Um, my background, I came from industry. I, I was for a while a executive, a, a design engineer in a consulting firm. My background is a, a bachelor's in chemistry, master's in industrial chemistry and a PhD in environmental engineering. And I've pretty much been in the, the, the aqueous water engineering uh, field uh, for my entire career. Um, uh, so I've worked for a couple of different design firms. Uh, I've designed, actually designed, permitted, uh, uh, did construction observation for a number of water plants across the country. And uh, my area of, of expertise relative to design is the desalination process. So desalination process is taking seawater or brackish water and making it drinkable. And so for that reason, I teach like the senior design course in our program. I also teach some graduate courses on aquatic chemistry and uh, water, you know, water, wastewater infrastructure design. So our research interests in my group are water quality chemistry, uh, process design issues, uh, mass transfer is really where we focus uh, our efforts, uh, and process operations, uh, which is involving typically operations cost and performance, uh, infrastructure and alternative water supplies. And so you can kind of read the, uh, the, the slide yourself, but I've, I've, uh, I currently have five PhD students in my group three master's students, and I put out 13 PhDs over the years with 22 master's students, all in this arena. Um, so our, my funding agencies, although we do some work for NSF and the Department of Agriculture and the Navy over the years, most of our work comes from the Water Research Foundation or the utility industry, cities, municipal governments, counties, those types of things. And you can see we, 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 we travel. So why, why the three? $328 million a number. It's because that's the population of the country. And so uh, a couple key things before we talk about our research is that uh, people don't realize it, but any, any person's exposure to a contaminant in a public drinking water system is completely involuntary. And so you, you have to protect them from that potential risk of waterborne pathogen or waterborne contaminant being in the public water system. So it's heavily regulated. And in fact, the US EPA, uh, when it was uh, implemented and formed, it's the, any society the United States ever been existed has been the drinking water laws are the most comprehensive or complex le legislation ever created. And so it gets very, a lot of people say, well, you can solve this problem by using this, that, or the other thing, but it's very difficult because you are limited in how you can solve problems because of the public health. Whatever you do to that water is an immediate impact on health. And so the Safe Drinking Water Act was fundamentally established to balance uh, health with the need for water. And uh, current regulations are stricter to where they, it's a, it's a balance between getting sick the next week or two because you drink water versus getting possibly a tumor or cancer after drinking that water for 80 years. And so you have to balance the need between disinfection to kill the virus or pathogen and a disinfection byproduct that could cause a cancer later in your life. And so that's where our research area really is focused in, is, a, is understanding that balance, especially when it comes to engineering and cost. So I, the best way to explain our research is to give you a couple of examples. And so uh, the first example is uh, for NSF, is uh, uh, Dingbao Wang, one of our uh, a faculty in, within our group uh, helped develop a program to come after a rapid uh, proposal that we were funded on. And I don't know if you remember in the news, any of you uh, realized that uh, right here in local in Polk County, Florida, a few years back, had a huge sinkhole form. And uh, a lot of this radioactive waste from this uh, phosphate manufacturing plant went into the groundwater. Now, Florida produces more phosphate uh, related minerals than anywhere else in the planet. We have the largest phosphate reserves in the world is right here in Central Florida. 
And so there's these huge mines down there. And so this, uh, you can see this picture, that's a sinkhole where uh, this uh, processing water went into the aquifer. Now in Florida, 80% of the public drink groundwater or treated brackish water. In the United States of America, 80% of the public drink surface water supplies. And so Florida relies heavily on groundwater. And so the issue was, oh, this is contaminated. What's gonna happen? And the, the mosaic is the, was the plant, it's the, it's the chemical company that uh, mines this phosphate. So here's a picture of the, the facility. You can see the manufacturing processes in the back, the mining operation. And if you can see, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but here are these, these, these reservoirs are um, where the waste uh, of the, that contain radionuclides as they process this ore, that's how they store it and then evaporates eventually. And you can see this whole area here used to have this, would store this waste as they processed it. And you can see the sinkhole right there. So all that water went straight into the groundwater. So the project was, you know, what does that mean to the uh, regional supplies? Because as it turns out, uh, go back, Tampa Bay Water, Polk County uh, utilities had drinking water wells located near this facility. So um, Ding Bao and our water resources group started modeling the impacts of, you know, how the groundwater would be impacted by this chemistry and uh, tried to model and predict uh, the impact of all this radionuclides. We had to estimate how much was in the water and how long it would take to get to those wells. And our job, my part of the project was to what do you do about it when it gets there? So here's a, a summary. You can see that, you can see the size of the sinkhole that was formed. And of course, this is their repairing to try to fill it in and close it up. Um, and you can see in this picture, what this chart shows is that it, the, the blue wells are the well fields for Polk County. And the green wells are the well fields for Tampa Bay Water. So once Dingbao and our other colleagues started working on this, we realized that the general groundwater flow was toward the Tampa Bay water wells. And Mosaic was pumping the groundwater to try to stop the contamination from spreading. So what this project was for is, okay, what, what's the long-term impact of this? And so we used the models that were developed uh, within our research team and came up with some ideas and concepts of how to deal with this if this water was ever to get those wells. So uh, the estimate was going to be about six years it would take, and uh, uh, what would you do about it? So our group um, decided that you'd have to do things, you'd have to monitor these wells for a long term, and you'd have to design a water treatment plant to treat that water if it ever was to contaminate. And so that's what we did. We designed a water treatment plant. Here's an example of one of Polk County's wells in their treatment plant. There's not much to it. They bring the water out of the ground, they disinfect it, aerate it, store it, and pump it to your home. So we had to design uh, pretty much a high-tech facility to treat for the radionuclides, and we had to come out with the cost for it, and that's what we produced as a part of the result. And you can see it's a pretty expensive uh, impact because Tampa Bay Water had to turn off their wells. So they invested money in the wells, they turn them off, and they lose as much revenue every year. Uh, and this was published in one of the uh, Springer Nature's scientific reports. There's been other publications, but this is the this was the main one out of that work. So another example is City of Sarasota. City of Sarasota, we've been working with for several years. They have a desalination plant, and they treat uh, for the community about 100,000 people in the Sarasota area. And so they had had a problem where, if you remember, when they were building the the uh, large dam in China um, back several years ago the uh, Chinese had bought up pretty much most of the capacity of sulfuric acid. And so a lot of these, uh, this is a brackish water desalination plant. So they take brackish water and they treat it to drinking water standards. And the problem was is that this price of sulfuric acid went from $70 per ton to $300 per ton in three days. And so if you're a municipal government that has a, that has a budget, that's a problem because you don't have enough, you can't buy enough acid, you'd run out of money. So we were, retained by the city to do a study to how do we get rid of sulfuric acid and run these unit operations. So that was like the engineering side of the project. And uh, we ended up 
coming up with a plan by doing some pilot plant testing and some pictures here to kind of show the work that we did. Pretty complicated project, but in the end, we saved them. We figured out a way to get them off acid. They could still run their desalting plant and save them about $100,000 a year. And that's a continual savings uh, with their new process. From an academic standpoint, we were very much interested in what would happen with the change in the process. So we wanted to study mass transfer. So we spent a lot of time studying mass transfer, my group. And so this is one of the things for the first time in this arena of drinking water treatment, reverse osmosis membranes are um, uh, plastics technology. So they're thin film composites. And uh, down here on the left, if you can see a picture, that's a picture of, a, of an actual membrane surface of the membrane we were using in this plant. And we had several years of data on how the uh, mass transfer of the salt would occur and be rejected from this plant. So I had a student that I challenged to say, hey, let, let's find a way to where we can mathematically model in a different way these surfaces and uh, provide an accurate uh, prediction of how much water would be produced and how much salt would be removed under this new paradigm. And so uh, what she did is we were able to come up with just basically using some white noise and some Gaussian distributions, we were able to create a similar surface to the actual membrane that's in the plant. And then we use this to model mass transfer by diffusion and came up with predictive models. Um, and several of these publications were published. So the outcome, research outcome in this work was five-year capital improvements plan, 100,000 a year, generated four PhDs and a master's student. Uh, that's how much work was involved in these things. Eight publications, uh, 18 proceedings and the best paper. Another example is in Butts County, Georgia. Those of you that watch Stranger Things, any of you guys watched uh, that show? That's where they filmed it was this uh, in this uh, Jackson, Georgia, where this utility was that we worked with. And this was a project they came to us for help. They had this red water. I mean, you wouldn't want to drink water that looks like that. And so what utilities do is they flush their system so that the consumer doesn't receive this water. But that costs a lot of money. So we did some, uh, uh, some chemistry and some corrosion testing for these guys. And we were able to come up with a plan that would eliminate the corrosion of this system. And this project generated two master's students with, uh, with just only one referee publication because there wasn't a lot of academic things that came out of this work other than the fact that we helped this utility improve its water system. And then the, the last uh, example I have is a county of Maui water supply. This is a surface water supply. And this water is up uh, on Haleakala Mountain. And we've been working with uh, Hawaii since uh, 2011. And there's no, um, in volcanic uh, water supplies, there's no uh, minerals. So it's all organic acids. So the water is like a pH 4, pH 5 when you're dealing with it. And when you disinfect that water, it produces a tremendous amount of disinfection byproducts, which are regulated because you don't want people getting cancer, you're suspected carcinogens. So you don't want people to get cancer later in their life. And this water is very difficult to treat. So we spent uh, quite a bit of time working with them and we, our research group traveled five times a year to Hawaii for about this, what, 10 years, nine years to try to help them solve these problems. And here's uh, one, of my, one of my PhD students at the time, she was a student, she's graduated now, working on the corrosion rack. But we were able to come up, they were gonna spend millions of dollars to solve this problem. And our research helped them go about it in a different way because of mass transfer calculations. And so based on this research, we, we eliminated some of their construction. We added in some simpler ways to treat the water, saved them about 4 million in capital, about a million in operating costs, generated two PhDs, two masters, an honors and a major. And uh, uh, you, know, you can read the best paper. And so we, we uh, you can't, in 10 minutes, you can't go over each one of these projects, but that gives you a flavor of the type of work that we've done to help communities. And uh, that work was published. We published um, some pretty high level peer reviews on the disinfection byproducts chemistry uh, of this water system. So to wrap up um, on the left part of the slide is my collaborations here on campus and elsewhere, at least the more, more recent ones. And our near term opportunities is that we, uh, the Lenk, uh, the Corrosion laws for the Sea Drinking Water Act are getting more stricter. I don't, I don't know if you remember Flint, Michigan being in the news and problems with lead in people's water supplies. And so the uh, city of Sarasota has come back to us and said, hey, we want to do another project and have you look at our lead corrosion rates because we think that as we, we're building more buildings and we're using more uh, 
materials and construction, we're worried about the amount of lead that's in our system. So we're gonna be doing a study with them to help them optimize their lead corrosion rates and prepare for the, the newer stricter standards. And the long-term opportunities is to, uh, is to look at the reclaimed water and the, uh, the wastewater supplies and turning them into drinking water and how mass transport of these contaminants work through these unit operations and, and do some engineering to save some money and then continue to pursue these, uh, these public health projects that we do uh, throughout the country and mainly in, the, in these Caribbean and Pacific Rim Islands that we work from. We do a lot of work in the islands. And this is by uh, three of the last year's research groups and some of the things I've talked about today that they're, they're acknowledgements of the, of the sponsors that we work with. 